Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired, you feel taken care of, and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today I'm sharing the three moves for becoming his number one priority. Instead of celebrating their 10-year anniversary, my guest Melissa and her husband were discussing separation. They'd stopped communicating about important stuff, which seemed like a good solution since most of their conversations became arguments, including discussions about parenting and his drinking. But when she cleaned up her side of the street, his reaction was beyond her wildest dreams. He started working to be a better person, quit drinking, and wanted to be with her and the kids more. Today, she says they have so much more fun together, and they're so much more relaxed. She's going to describe the steps she took so you can copy them. The Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award is from an article in a major women's online magazine about the signs that tell you your relationship is over. And wow, is it ever far out there and appalling. All of that's coming up. But first, I'm going to share three moves for becoming his number one priority. Does your husband always have friends over or talk to his best friend more than you? Aren't you supposed to be his best friend? Isn't that why you got married in the first place? Whether he's a social butterfly or a barfly, not being his number one is downright disappointing. It can feel hopeless and so lonely and make you angry too. I mean, going it alone surely isn't what you had in mind when you said, I do. Maybe you've tried throwing down the gauntlet and you told him you need him to spend more time with you. If so, you already know that setting ultimatums and making him choose only pushes him further away. Fortunately, there's an alternative, one that actually works. Here's what to do when your husband puts his friends first so that you can become irresistible and get the attention you deserve. Number one, stop being a good wife. How have you tried to get your man to spend more time with you? I asked nicely. I asked angrily. I pleaded. I told him how I felt. I felt like he'd rather watch TV than spend time with me. Criticizing, cajoling, and controlling didn't feel very dignified. Worse yet, none of it worked. The only relationship that improved was his relationship with the TV remote. That's because all my misguided attempts to make him spend time with me were disrespectful. And I had no idea that respect is like oxygen for men. I had no idea I was being disrespectful for that matter. That's because disrespect and inappropriate control can look a lot like being the best wife ever. Here's what I mean. Yvonne felt like she had to drop whatever she wanted to do to be at her husband's disposal if she was having any chance of spending time with him. That meant being at his beck and call for three-hour talks, even if she was hungry or yawning or really had to use the restroom. They were on the brink of divorce, and if she rocked the boat, she was afraid he would be gone for good. He had resolved to stay away from her. So she had to take what she could get, whatever it might cost her, right? As considerate as all of this seemed toward him, somehow it was never enough. With the support of her relationship coach, Yvonne saw that bending over backwards for him wasn't serving her, but was part of what had led to their breakdown. She realized that trying to make him happy out of fear of displeasing him was actually a form of manipulation of control. So she changed the dance. The next time he launched into one of their marathon talks, she told him she needed to go eat. A brave start to putting her own needs and limitations first. That's when a surprising thing happened. He started being more considerate of her. He offered to talk earlier when she had more time and energy. The tone of their talks changed too. He went from clearly not enjoying it just going through the motions to do his sacrificial duty as a husband to wanting to talk to her. He even laughed one time when he said, I always have time to spend with my wife. And he meant it. He not only started asking to spend time together, he asked to reconcile. These days, 
They spend lots of time together, something they used to fight over. So much for being a good wife. When she started focusing on her own needs more, he responded to her so much better. Number two, tune into your social self-care. Even if you're determined to respect his guy time, you're only human, you might get annoyed when he's at that darn video game again or watching the Walking Dead marathon until he starts to resemble a zombie himself. Except a zombie would actually acknowledge that you exist. If you find yourself begrudging his self-care, that's valuable information because it's usually a warning light that your self-care tank is starting to run low. It's tempting to take the bait that you're the only grown-up in the house and now you have to make dinner and clean up and do bath time and bedtime since he obviously has no intention of lifting a finger. However, you know that doing everything yourself could make you resentful. Well, you could choose resentment, of course, or you could choose intimacy. What if you were to hightail it out the door yourself or, or to the bathtub or to bed for a cat nap? I know, I know you're the wife. You don't have that luxury. Somebody has to get it done. The question is, who put it all on your shoulders? In my case, it was me. And once I quit the nasty habit of doing everything myself, there was a lot more space for my husband to step up and be the hero. And as it turns out, I love my space too, because he even started doing dishes. Then he started doing all the dishes. And to this day, I don't wash dirty dishes. This is about honoring yourself, your limitations, your desires, and your need for your own self-care. That's right. I said need. Just as respect is like oxygen for men, self-care is like oxygen for women. This is not about having a power struggle to make him do anything or about bowing to his whims either. That goes for spending time together. If his friends cancel on him and he wants to spend time with you, it won't make you rude to let him know you have other plans. Respecting your own time and plans has a way of inspiring him to follow suit. Part of Yvonne's recipe for becoming super happy, as she came to describe herself, was cultivating her own rich life in self-care. She even gave herself permission to move to an expensive apartment where she could take walks around the marina. What would make you super happy? For me, the answer meant scrapping my old ideas about what I thought constituted self-care, which was things like yoga and chia seed green juice and boot camp workouts. Those are all good for me, sure. But they didn't feel joyful while I was doing them. Volleyball, poker, and chocolate, on the other hand, those do. Some essentials on my list are creative self-care, spiritual self-care, social self-care. If you're anything like me, surrounding yourself with your own circle of friends or a community of like-minded women, like the one in the Ridiculously Happy Wife program, is indispensable for both you and your marriage. So what's on your self-care list? What if you started to schedule at least three things from your list every day? Imagine what it would look like to be so filled up that you could show up to your relationship as your best self, your super happy self. Here's what I see happen. Your man will be drawn to your presence. It's a virtuous cycle where he'll want to do even more to add to your happiness. That's because nothing is more contagious than his wife's happiness. Number three, find your flirt. Piling on your own self-care not only frees you from resenting him for being the king of self-care, it is the key to turning the magnet around the right way. It empowers you to honor how you feel and what you desire, to make your favorite meal or order it if you're too tired to cook, to show up fun and flirty, to flaunt your femininity, putting on an outfit you feel great in and feeling even better when he starts to notice you again, to break your routine, to to mention while telling him how much you loved your previous session, something you'd love to try next time you're in the bedroom. To express your desires in a way that inspires, like mentioning that you'd love to visit Tennessee or Bali. Yvonne told her husband she wanted to move to Florida, and less than two months later, they did just that. To send him sexy texts, watch a funny movie, 
share inside jokes, uh, to remember the old days, including what attracted you to him, and to remember the woman you were when you attracted him. Now that you have all these powerful ways to become your man's priority, what will you do first to prioritize yourself? If you'd like to be my guest on the Empowered Wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. Just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. Instead of celebrating their 10 year anniversary, my guest Melissa and her husband were discussing separation. They had stopped communicating about important stuff, which seemed like a good solution since most of their conversations became arguments, including parenting and his drinking. But when she cleaned up her side of the street, his reaction was beyond her wildest dreams. He started working to be a better person, quit drinking, and wanted to be with her and the kids more. Today, she says they have so much more fun together and they're so much more relaxed. So she's going to describe the steps she took so you can copy. Melissa, welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast. Thank you so much for coming on to share your story. Hey, Laura. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Well, let's um, go back to the bad old days. What were things like in your marriage? Oh, boy. Um, there were really a lot of issues before I had the skills. I just, I had this demanding corporate job. I worked all time zones. I traveled deadlines. There was this crazy office culture and everybody just bragged about how many meetings there had and you know how, how their plate was overflowing. And it was just this really exhausting and stressful environment. Um, and, and we had two, two sons, they were back to back and I went back to work and I just wanted to give my kids the world, but I was spread so thin. Um, and I just, you know, I, I remember having all those new mom pressures and expectations of myself and like, like the holiday card and the Halloween costume and, you know, making sure they had healthy, healthy meals and the birthday parties. And I just thought I had to be this like Pinterest perfect person. And it was, you know, super drowning and, and overwhelming. And I just, I was just trying to keep up. And that's really when our marriage started to slip. So, um, you know, my husband and I, we were just so busy and drained. There was just really no time for, for him and I. And, um, you know, I talked to my friends like, oh, you know, with the kids, like, do you interact with your husband as much as before? We thought that was pretty normal, you know, like, and, and then for us, it was like these arguments started just these really awful, terrible arguments. And it seemed like every, I call them adulting, like every adult conversation, just, they just turned in these like horrible personal attacks. And, and I just didn't understand it. Like I would bring something up that I thought was like totally logical, was in the best interest of our family. And my husband would just completely flip out and he would verbally attack me and I mean, to the point that I thought that he was bipolar and he had like anger management issues. Um, so, so what kinds of topics were you bringing up that were getting this kind of response? I mean, I, parenting was a huge one. Oh, okay. That was big. I mean, any kind of finance things, um, you know, any kind of time with my family, time with his family. And I just would end up, you know, I felt like I was always defending myself. Right. And we just, we did not communicate like two people that loved each other, we communicated like two people that really hated each other. It was just the resentment started building and our house just became this like battleground. And then, and then it was like, we would just point out the things that the other person did wrong with judgment and criticism. Like, like it was like, okay, you hurt me. So I'm going to hurt you back. And it was like, okay, well, you forgot his soccer cleats again. And uh, well, you left the keys in the car last night. And like, oh, so you forgot my mom's birthday. Thanks a lot. I mean, just all this like hurtful attacks and scorekeeping and competition and just like really petty stuff, like just back and forth, you know? And, and it was just, it was awful. And you're right. I didn't, we didn't celebrate our 10 year anniversary. Um, we were totally failing and it was really scary because I was scared because we weren't 
addressing important things to me like parenting and finances and these cold words would last for weeks. It was just, it was falling apart. Um, yeah, it was really bad stuff. We would fake being happy at like, you know, different type of events. Right. And then I would have hope like, Oh, okay. Like today was really good. And then, and then like another fight would happen and it would just be, I mean, I actually went to his parents and I told them that we have to do something because of his bipolar and anger issues. I just could not stand to be mistreated anymore. And I really felt hopeless. Like I was done. And I thought he was done. Like we were just, we were, we were really exhausted and done with each other. It's really sad. So, and you were, you were talking about separating and possibly divorce. It sounds like. We did. Um, yeah, we, we even, we tried marriage counseling and it was like a complete bust, like didn't help anything, waste of time, waste of money, just built more resentment. Right. And, mm. um, you know, it just, it was so confusing. We left with like no tools at all, um, you know, from there. And, you know, I was just, we were talking about separation almost like like an adult would talk about it. Like, how are we here? Like, how can two educated adults that want to make things work, not be able to figure it out? Like, how is it that we can't get along? Because we both kind of wanted to try, but then we'd still end up talking about like, well, we, we don't know how to do it. And we would end up back at that scary, terrifying place. And how is this uh, affecting your little boys? No, that was the scariest part. You were just you know, we didn't know, we didn't want to be teaching what we were teaching them at that point. Right. I mean, they were, they were really young. Um, but yeah, I mean, it wasn't good. It's not, it's not the, you know, that stable home life that you dream that you're going to have for your kids. And it was like, we were also just in like survival mode. Um, so it was really just, yeah, just hectic and, and, and miserable. And, and they definitely heard some fighting that I, you know, we wouldn't want to hear. It's pretty, kind of ashamed of, of those days. And I'm glad they're, you know, they're far behind us now. Thanks to you. Thank you. (laughs) So was there a moment when you said, um, we just can't go on like this, like something's got to give here. I don't know that there was like one particular moment. Like there were so many moments of, we can't go on, you know, staying in hotel rooms and, you know, maybe, you know, one of us didn't show for the other person when we are supposed to go to like a wedding or a family event or like, just like, and it's like, okay, it's just this, like, it wasn't one moment. It was like this perpetual state of like fragility, like being on the edge, like we were going to break at any second. And then I got really lucky because I had a girlfriend to come out that came out to visit me and she was visiting me as part of her new self-care activities. Mm. And she, um, she witnessed one of our very embarrassing fights and um, she had just rekindled her own marriage. And so she turned me on to your book. And um, that is really how I came to learn about the skills. Yeah, it was very, yeah. Was, she said, you don't know how much power you have in your marriage. And I was like, what? Like power? I, I like I like that. Like, what do you, what do you mean? And then, uh, and then I listened to you on Audible on repeat, oh, way more than I'd like to admit. <laughs> <laughs> we were hanging out together. How long? Yeah, that? we were. I feel like I know you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you, so what did you hear from the book that kind of changed your perspective from where you had been? Well, um, I was never, ever vulnerable. Um, I really had no idea that this like, you know, businesswoman, this independent self-sufficient, like boardroom, like tendencies were submarining my marriage. Um, you know, I, we go to work all day and like, you know, you're breaking grass, glass ceilings and you're, you know, you're, and then you come home and my husband would say sometimes like you run our lives, like, like, uh, like the office. And I just, I didn't even know what that meant. Um, and I just, I did, I think I just ran a tight ship and, you know, I, I just remember in your book saying like, you know, I didn't say like, I miss you. I said like, you know, why that beep? Did you not come to bed last night? You know, it was like, and when I felt hurt, I would just rage and I put off this, like, well, I don't need you attitude. If you're going to act like that, then I don't need, I don't need you. Um, and I just, I had no idea that he really wanted me to need him, you know? And, and that's really how he felt successful in the relationship. So when I said those things, like, no, I I don't want to be separated. Like 
I need you. Like, I'm scared. I'm, I don't want to be alone. Like I, I can't do this alone. Um, you know, it, it just, it really, it really changed a lot. So, so getting in touch with like that rage underneath and really tuning into my feelings, um, you know, stop putting my fists up so much all the time. And, and even say like, you know, that, you know, that I feel rejected or I feel lonely and embarrassed and like all those things that like, I never, ever, ever did. Um, my husband responded to that so differently. And it was like, it was like, I felt like I was turning into my like femininity versus my like feminism. Um, and then saying, ouch, right. Like when those hurtful attacks would come, it was like, ouch, and I'm done. And I walk away and, you know, it's just, he, he's heard me. Like, I want to help her. I want to figure out a solution to this. Like he would like come back into the room and like, be like, are you okay? And it, you know, it just, and then with the anger, it's like, he, he didn't drink and ignore me anymore. Right. Like he was running away from from my like wrath before. And, and really, he, he really kind of cut back on the drinking and, you know, he would sleep in bed with, with me instead of the kids. So it was, it was a big shift. Wow. So I, I love this piece about the rage. I just, I remember what that was like and how um, it, it was embarrassing. And it was also incredibly lonely to be a rager. Mm-hmm. I remember cause mm-hmm. you're I remember thinking like, he's not going to want to stick around if I continue to act like this. Yes. And I couldn't stop acting like this. Either. I, I had no options. And so, um, and so you, so you're a reformed rager too. It sounds like, <laughs> yeah. so is that, um, and, and so you, so you adopted these other ways of being more vulnerable and that had an incredibly, you got a, a much better response from him. <clears throat> how did you, how did you do that? Cause I think that's a, that's a journey that seems kind of mysterious in a way, like, wait a minute, I, you were raging and now you say things like, oh, I miss you and I need you and I, um, and ouch. So how, how did you find the courage to do that? Or, I mean, I, I think it was just recognizing, like, you know, I, you taught us a lot about heart messages, right? And like, instead of being on the defensive, I was like, what is his heart message here? Like, if it would be about finances, a lot of times I'm like, okay, he's freaking out because he just wants to be a good provider. And then I was able to see like, you know, what his heart message is and stop the anger. And then I could take a step back and then say, okay, well, I hear you about the finances, but I, I feel rejected about this or, you know, or, and I would say how I felt all on my paper and instead of attacking him about what he did to me, um, and so that was transforming. That was a big, big, big deal. Um, and we just felt like, oh my gosh, look, we can actually have these adulting conversations without wanting to strangle each other. This is wonderful. <laughs> the way that your book was inspired me so much that it didn't seem so scary after you hear how somebody else did it and how it worked for them. And, you know, I'm, I'm not one to give up so easily. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try this. And I experimented all the time. And then you know, when I really stepped into like learning, learning about respect and control and, you know, how, you know, my husband wasn't bipolar with anger management issues. I was triggering him and I was disrespecting him and I had no idea. And so it was, it was actually pretty simple at the beginning because it was like, okay, I'll experiment with this. I'll experiment with that. And it was like, okay, when I'm on his paper and when I disrespect him, he explodes or ignores me. And when I don't, things are good. So it was like, it was, but I couldn't always, you know, I I couldn't, I couldn't always be perfect. Right. And there was so much learning about respect from the beginning that I didn't know. Like I would ask him to do something for me. If he didn't do it quick enough, I would just do it myself. And he would get mad. And I like, didn't understand like what, like, I didn't see how that was like a disrespectful thing. Like Mm -hmm. I need to just, you know, respect the timeline. Like, you know, he'll, wash the car whenever, whatever it was. Right. So I just, and I didn't trust him with the kids. That was a really big thing too. Like I, I thought since I was the mom and I knew the schedule and, you know, it was like, you know, the parenting thing, like I would read all these parenting articles and I'd send them these are parenting articles. And it was like, well, you didn't read these parenting articles. So you have to do it my way. And like, you gave him sugar after six o'clock or, you know, that lotion wasn't organic. How could you? I mean, I just like laugh now at like this stuff. And I, I just, I learned what I didn't, so I didn't stick with a book, 
you know, I, I knew it was me once I learned, you know, stuff about the book. And then I ended up hiring a coach. And, you know, she helped me so much with all of the control and understanding this like fear-based world that I was living in that I didn't know I was, I was in, I had all these like reactions based in fear. And I think that's common for new moms. I know it was for me, like, I'm scared the kids aren't going to get enough sleep or I'm scared they're you're not going to be able to learn or, you know, if they don't, you know, they're not going to eat healthier. Like this isn't healthy enough. It's just like all these fears that I live by were so unrealistic and out of my control. So like, it was so easy to let go and be vulnerable when I understood like, okay, I'm operating from a sense of fear, but it definitely took a coach to get me there. Like, no, my kid's not going to get cancer. If he doesn't use organic lotion, that yeah. fear is unrealistic. It's just so funny. So, <laughs> so if they go to bed late, it's okay. You know, it's just not worth the argument and I got to let it go. So, you know, it's just, it was learning like this, you know, learning where I end and he begins and, whether it was parenting or drinking or his health or, you know, his timeliness or responses. I mean, all this stuff that was like, you know, life started to really change when, when I became aware of those things. So thank you. Oh gosh. That's, that's great. Well, so yeah, you bet. So, and so, um, was that, was there a moment when you said, okay, this really is working that kind of encouraged you to dive deeper like that? The first day that I really experimented when I, when I opened the book and I used the skills, it was really funny. I just, I just tested whatever you think, right. Which is not, you know, I thought everything was 50, 52. I should give my opinion on everything, which is fine. And, um, I was just, I was in our laundry room and I was cleaning out all these hats, getting ready to make donations. And there were like 30 hats in there. And I thought, okay, I'm going to ask him like, Hey, which of these can I donate? And so I asked him and he said, none of them. And And one of them, I mean, some of them had the tags on them. One of them said, make Mexico great again. Like they were like stupid. And like the old me would have been like, um, this one says make Mexico great. This has the tag. Like you've never worn these. Like, why can't I do it? And I just said, whatever you think. And, and then, you know, I just kept on doing my thing. He walked to the back of the house. He came back and he goes, Hey, you can donate all of those hats. Just keep the Patagonia ones. And that was like 25 hats. And I was like, okay. And it was just so opposite than anything else I had ever done. I was like, oh, there's something here. And then on the same day, it was so funny because there was a ladder and it was in our, like, it was like practically, it was in the front yard. It was in the driveway. I was like, and I was kind of complaining about this ladder before, you know, like, oh, we look like rednecks with the ladder in the, in the yard. The kids are going to hurt themselves with the ladder. And then I just thought I'll express my desire, right? What's my desire with this? You know, my desire is I would love a clutter-free yard. And I tried it. And that ladder had been there for a month. And he moved that ladder that day, Laura. And I was like, okay, I got to, I got to figure out what's going on here. There's something I'm not doing that I could be doing. And I need to learn. I mean, just like with parenting, I read all these parenting books, like, how do you talk to your kids? And I'd never learned how to talk to your husband. And so this was like that formula that I was looking for and, and, and desperately needed. I mean, we were in desperate mode for, for help at that time. So yeah, it was, it was fantastic. So I, I remember those, that first day, like, okay, okay, I'm hooked. <laughs> so how has your husband responded to you making all these changes overall? Um, I mean, you talk about that wife mirror thing. And, you know, I just really wanted to be a better person. I wanted to be a better mom. I wanted to be a better wife. I just wanted to be, and, and and like, since I've been on this journey, he just jumped right on board and he's doing the same. And it's, it's been really powerful. I mean, he, um, he quit drinking and, you know, I was really scared about his health for a long time. And, um, you know, I would complain about it. And when I relinquished control of his health and just, you know, said, I I trust you. And, you know, I, I became his cheerleader and I, I would build him up instead of like tear him down all the time. Um, you know, I just saw these wonderful things happen. You know, we're, we're both healthier because we want to like, we want to live long, happy lives together and, and be there for each other. And we have this, like, you know, this, just this unconditional love that I, I really, I really thought at one time, like I could only have that kind of love for my kids. And now it's like, I really have that with my husband. And it's just, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just fantastic. So it's, it's, it's pretty magical. So it sounds like 
you, yeah, you both want to live longer. This is worth living for. Right. As opposed to um, kind of the pain and exhaustion you were in before. In some ways, it's like, yeah, it's, uh, it's not motivating to want to right. live a long time. <laughs> <'Cause>, yeah, <laughs> I know. It's just like, I really uh, want wake up to another this? day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's inspiring, Melissa. Well, so that's that's impressive. And when well, I uh, should also say, he wasn't angry anymore. Like the anger was gone. Like that's how the response. Like you know, I mean, I thought he was bipolar with anger issues. Like all of those, like you diagnosed your husband thing. Like, oops, that was me. Told his family and everything. And if I didn't trigger him, he wasn't angry. Like I remember when I ran, I ran my jeep into the side of the my garage two times, not once, but twice. And he didn't even get mad. Did it? <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> he, he does not have a problem. <laughs> oh my gosh. So you, so there was a total paradigm shift of how you, how you see him now compared to how you saw him in the battle days. It sounds like. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, um, okay. So, and what's it like around your house now? What's it like at your home? Oh, this is the fun part. You know, it's just, I mean, the laughter's back, right? Like that was missing. I mean, we have so much fun. It's just like, it's forgiving too. Like that's, that's the other thing. I mean, you know, I said, we used to be on top of each other about like, you know, what you didn't do and what I didn't do. And it's just like forgiving. I mean, we mess up and it's like, you know, it's, you, you apologize for it. You take accountability for it and it's, and it's playful and it's like, it's passionate. It's very passionate. Like, you know, instead of, instead of being on top of each other in different ways, we're, we're on top of each other in a whole nother kind of way now. <laughs> so, and it's just rock solid. So it's like, and that those were his words. I mean, he always says like, you know, we're just so rock solid now. And it's like, I love, and I, we always call each other like, you know, you're my rock. And, and, and it's just, we're a team. There's no competition and that safety and security of having this partner and like, you know, that you can totally screw up and you're still loved. And it's, um, it's just so much healthier and it's just, you know, it was so toxic and I just, I'm just so happy. And, and he does these things that like, you know, just the other night, he's like, it just out of the blue. He's like, okay, he, he knows what'll make me happy. So he's like, okay, kids, let's turn off the devices and let's play a game with mom tonight. You know, and it's just out of the blue, like, you know, he shifted to spend more time with my family. He said, you know what? You said you wanted to spend more time with your family. Like, why don't we, instead of doing Thanksgiving with my family this year, let's do it with your family. Like, I mean, it's like these thoughtful mind-blowing just you feel so loved and adored and cherished it's really um yeah it's just it's just incredible wow and how about your kids how has this impacted them oh, I love hearing when one of them says something mean to the other one and he says ouch and he doesn't fight back like I mean they learn the skills too just by being in this this house right and like um you know I feel like there's so much accountability and and you know it's just what do you, the only thing that you want to give your kids is like a solid ground. Right. And we didn't have that before. And, and now, you know, it, it, I'm just so proud. I, I used to be proud of my career and now I'm like, I'm so proud of my like rock solid family life. And it's the only thing that matters. It's just like, it's an unbelievable gift for it. It's just really, really incredible. Wow. I give you so much credit for doing everything that you've done to create this because, um, it's that's a long way to come from um, from raging and talking about separation and feeling like he's got anger issues and bipolar to feeling like you're each other's rocks and you're having all this fun and he's so thoughtful and is really cherishing you now is amazing and you did all that so it's pretty incredible what what is your tip for someone who she's listening and she's where you were or maybe she, maybe she's raging and her husband drinks too much and she wishes he would stop being so angry all the time and uh, mm -hmm. that they could have conversations about these adult things like parenting and finances. Um, she doesn't know how to get there. She wants what you've created. What's your best tip for her? Just really consider the possibilities that it's not all him and that there are truly skills that you can learn to be a better partner. Um, you know, dive in, get connected with this community, get a coach, like try, like experiment, like, you know, just doing those experiments and seeing for yourself, the results. I mean, you can listen to the podcast, you can listen to other things, but just, you know, having the courage to really step out of your comfort zone. I mean, we're just, 
I think that like my generation, we're just this driven, like lots of powerful women, right? And, and it can be so hard to receive help and find vulnerability and, and find like the, the feelings that are deep to your heart and, and, and like say how you feel and not what the other person did to you. So just, you know, consider that those I miss you words and I need you and I can't do this alone and I need help and just, you know, let them in, let your guard down, figure out your desires um, what they would be and, and let him care for you. I, I didn't, you know, I had that, like, well, I can take care of myself. <laughs> I don't need a man. I don't, why do I need him to care for me when I can care for myself? So it, it's just, it just makes him feel successful when he can care for you. And I didn't let him do that. So, you know, share the things with him that are super scary to share. And, and, and it just, it brings you that much closer. It's like, it's just kind of mind blowing. And then I have to say, like, you know, respect, gratitude, self-care, all of that. They're, they're just really, they're essential to every healthy relationship. It's just learning really the combo of them all. I mean, I don't want to make it sound overwhelming because you said one tip, but it's, um, you know, it's just a combo, you know, it, it's just a combination uh, of it all. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a great, what you're teaching is working. So thank you so much. Oh, well, and, and I think an overarching theme that I hear is um, when you regained your hope, that's when you started to feel empowered and to really hone in on learning these skills, really practicing these skills. And nobody's yeah. perfect with the skills, but it sounds like it made such a night and day difference in your house, which, um, and, and that's, I think that's what we're all longing for when you're feeling like this is hopeless, this marriage is hopeless and it might end and I don't know how to sustain it. Um, and you were able to make it last. Uh, which is, yeah, super inspiring, exciting to hear. What, uh, what do you think you would say to Melissa from before if, um, if you could go back and tell her what you know now? Hmm. Um, I would say be accountable. You know, just take responsibility for what you could possibly have contributed to this. Like, I really thought it was all him because I just thought I was working so hard and reading so many articles and, and, and just, I mean, and if you've ever had anybody hurt you and they came back and said, gosh, I didn't mean to hurt you. I apologize for being disrespectful. And, and, and then you can just see how that like melts away. And, and I didn't have that in my relationship. And, and I, it just, you know, it just, add so much to your life when you can live in this like forgiving and loving and unconditional loving environment and to just, to just be accountable. I didn't know how I just didn't, I just didn't know how. So thank you for teaching me. That was just an unbelievable skill. Yeah. It's interesting. No, no one ever taught you before. Right. So you didn't know, was it hard to get willing to say those words? It was, but the second I saw the results of it, I realized how it's like, it's costing me so much to have my ego in the way here. I mean, what am I teaching my children right now? Why am I doing this? And, and my rage would disappear and I feel like a better person. And so, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was hard at first for like a hot second. And then it's like, you just see the results of it. And then it's not so hard. Wow. Wow. Amazing. I mean, um, you make it sound kind of easy. <laughs> you make it sound easy. And I know that, I know that it's not, it, it does take some focus, right? It takes some concentration. You're, you were totally learning a new dance. Your husband was having to adjust to that new dance. So that, that can take, uh, it can be scary. It can be scary, mm-hmm. but it, it just sounds like you were so courageous and so committed, very determined, Melissa. Thank and, you. Yeah. I admire that very much. And that's why you have this incredible story of transformation that you are so generously sharing with all of us. And uh, I'm so grateful. Well, Laura, I can't tell you how much these skills have changed my life. My gratitude for you runs so deep. I feel forever indebted to you and just saving me and my family and, and this ripple effect that it has with like so many people around me. And just, you know, I just love how you built this movement, this organic way from, from scratch. And I'm totally on board to, uh, to share my transformation. So it helps inspire others. So I really appreciate it. It's been, it's been quite an honor. If you'd like to be my guest on the empowered wife podcast and share about how you fixed a struggling relationship using the six intimacy skills, I would love to interview you. 
just go to lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest to let me know that you are willing to make a big contribution to ending world divorce by telling your relationship story. I look forward to meeting you. That's lauradoyle.org slash podcast dash guest. And now it's time for the worst relationship advice of the week award. It's the worst relationship advice of the worst relationship advice. Yeah, it's the worst relationship advice of the worst relationship advice of the week. The advice that's making me most cantankerous this week was sent to me by a relationship coach training student who found this relationship advice very depressing. And I can certainly see why I find it depressing too. But I also got all warm and fuzzy about getting your contribution to the podcast. So thank you for that. This is your anonymous shout out and my gratitude for you thinking of me and how much I would hate this because I surely do. The advice itself is from an article in a well-known magazine about the signs that tell you your relationship is over. Because your relationship being over is something that just happens to you, like an earthquake, as though you don't have any say about it. This messed up myth is everywhere. In fact, this particular article is one of many that they have on this site on the same theme. They have the six signs it's over, the five signs, the 12 signs, the early signs, and just signs that he doesn't love you anymore. No wonder I was so confused in the bad old days. Here's an especially appalling excerpt from this crackpot article, which starts out terribly and goes downhill from there. It reads, quote, if you don't feel the intense emotional connection you once shared and see that it has been replaced by vague civility, it might be time to move on. An uncontested divorce is probably the most hassle-free way to end your dysfunctional marriage and move on towards a more peaceful life. (laughs) What? (laughs) What? Wow. So not feeling intense emotional attachment means you should race to end your marriage with as little hassle as possible. Wow. I mean, even as the hard-boiled worst relationship advice of the week award judge that I am for all these years, I'm disgusted at how this advice so eagerly calls the relationship dysfunctional and urges the reader to get a hassle-free divorce now. Yikes. I'm so offended by this advice that I want to stomp on its foot as hard as I can and then play an annoying song like the hamster dance 41 times in a row at a very high volume for being so thoughtless and cruel about stealing the hope from a hurting woman about her marriage. Now, that's not my highest self that wants to do all that. I know, I know. but. As a mere mortal woman, I have these impulses sometimes. And that's also true in my marriage. Sometimes I get my feelings hurt and I heave a big dramatic sigh or I throw out a clever biting retort. Sometimes I get worried or overtired or hormonal. And since I'm married to a mere mortal man, sometimes he also gets hurt or angry or impatient, especially when I have a clever, biting retort. There have been many times when I didn't feel strong emotional attachment. Sometimes we just get on each other's nerves just for being ourselves. That's just part of marriage as far as I can tell. It's just part of being human. Feeling emotional attachment is important, of course, and that's part of what made us choose marriage and what makes marriage gratifying. But Getting married is also choosing the wisdom of no escape except for divorce or death. Otherwise, you could just live together. Marriage is an acknowledgement that there will be days when we don't feel super emotionally attached because you're sick or I am or the kids are or there's just too much work to do and not enough money, I'm too stressed out or this isn't how I thought it would be or you aren't how I thought you would be. 
you're not how I want you to be. Getting married is a way of saying, yeah, I know all that's going to happen. And I want to lash myself to you anyway. I want to stick it out and see what's on the other side. So I'm going to commit to staying together in front of God and everybody so that when I don't feel strong emotional attachment to you, I'll still be attached to you. And people come and witness that event as a way of saying, I see you and I support your vision of lashing yourself together when it gets ridiculously hard and you don't want to do it anymore. And having that encouragement and supervision from friends and family seems to work. A study in 2014 that was published in the Social Science Research Network found that couples who had one to 10 people at their wedding were 35% less likely to get divorced than those that had just gotten married on their own. And that was part of my marriage story too, that I wanted to get divorced, but I was too embarrassed. So I was stuck. I stuck myself. Thank goodness. Because on the other side of not feeling emotionally attached to him, but still having no escape was self-examination. That's where I was when I finally decided to stretch and try crazy new things to get out of marriage hell, like the six intimacy skills. And and that's where I decided to keep trying to do them even when I was terrible at them at first, because I got a taste of this deep gratification from feeling loved every day and dignity from keeping my cool and and pride of knowing that I know how to love, knowing that I've got those skills which I consider more important than any other skills I've ever cultivated in my life, even playing volleyball skills. And yes, there's emotional attachment between my husband and me on the other side, which is certainly important and worthy of great effort to attain. And there was something else on the other side of marriage hell that I value so highly. Maybe I knew it was there on some level, when I said, I do, I found a kinder, more evolved, more gentle and compassionate Laura on the other side of that marriage crucible, a more lovable Laura. My husband's actions and words are proof, sure, that I'm more lovable, but even I just love myself so much more than I was capable of loving myself before I intentionally committed myself to John for life. And if I'd gotten a no-hassle divorce when I didn't feel intense emotional connection, well, I would have jumped out of the self-development crucible. I would have walked away from the mirror. I would have lost out on so many things that I value so highly. And for those reasons, the advice that if you don't feel the intense emotional attachment you once shared and see that it has been replaced by vague civility, it might be time to move on. An uncontested divorce is probably the most hassle-free way to end your dysfunctional marriage and move on towards a more peaceful life is the very, very, very worst relationship advice I've heard all week. Listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, I'll share four ways to get the romance back. In the meantime, I hope you're having lots of fun. Today's fun fact is that the best part of wrapping presents is getting to bop everyone on the head with the empty wrapping paper roll. 